just sitting and, and looking at a picture that that when the, when the camera is is at, at, at foot level is is so revealing you know that that you see things that you that you never never ever picked up looking looking down at it from mm. from from two two feet away or ever and, and, and the great, a great thing with those is that, is that if you if you take if you if you're at the vet veterinary practice and you take x-rays before and after you would not believe how uh, again you know um, uh, one of the questions I've got or I very often ask is can you influence the, 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 the margins and the rotational value of the coffin joint and the majority of people say well no you can't because it's fixed and, and actually I don't believe that and, and certainly the work that we've done you know in that particular case you can you can inflate it and rather than put a wedge heel on you can actually rotate the joint um, anteriorly and pick it up um, just by inflating and not by wedging so, so it's your opinion that, that you can get a digital cushion to regenerate it? Oh, absolutely, without question. Yes, there are there are uh, acceptable tolerances, uh, and and that that you have to that, that you have to, to take on each individual case, because it depends on the anatomy and physiology that's created the problem in the first instance, and also how the the the, the hoof capsule is altered over a period of time. So so it's what I call phase one, phase two. The prognosis may differ from each case, depending on how much you can get. Depends on on on, on what you're dealing with in the first instance. And that's one thing we don't do. We don't categorise these. We tend to when you sit in in um, in 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 round table meetings and stuff like that, and and you'll hear one person will say, well, what it worked for me, and then somebody else will say, well, I tried it and it didn't work for me, but 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 actually you could be talking about fundamentals which were which are completely opposing, yeah. um, and until we categorise it and say, right, this is grade one, this is grade two, this is grade three. The reason it didn't work for for you was because you were dealing with grade three. The reason it worked for you was because you were dealing with grade one, yeah. and it would work. Um, but I think we tend to put things in boxes and want to tick them and, and say a long toe and a, and a deflated underrun heel is a long toe and it isn't, not always. I, I think that's a, um, a, a real deficiency of, of, of our profession is the fact to, to, to quantify and, 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 and get more specific exactly what we're, what we're talking yep. about. And, and I, I think we need to develop a system that, that we're talking about, we're we talking about a grade, grade one or a yep. grade four in, yep. in, in severity. Now, what, what kind of horses are, are you seeing now that are, 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 are a lot of your horses, especially for the upper levels coming from Europe, are they're, they're warm blitz? Um, well, we, well, the United Kingdom have, have had an amazing um, breeding program now, you know, by, by a, a number of people. So we're seeing a lot of homebreds. Uh, and of course, there is the the European influence as well. But there's an there's a lot of horses being bred in the UK now. Very good horses being bred in the UK. In, in the foundation stock, are, yes. are European warm blood. Yep, okay. yep, yep. And, and there's they're a little bit more. Well, the United States is, is getting a, a little yeah. bit of, of a, now a history yeah. of producing mm -hmm. home breds. Well, dressage globally is has just exploded, hasn't it? You know, I was only hearing the other day that that that. Um, there was a trainer from from the United Kingdom, quite a well-known trainer from the United Kingdom, it, it is going out to South Africa every month, uh, and and we'd never thought of that, would we? You know, a number of years ago, you'd never think, well, what dressage in South Africa? No, yeah, it's 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 global. It's the fastest uh, um, increasing number of people taking up equine sport um, is dressage. Yeah, I, I, I can yeah, it's the biggest growth. I, I see it in, in Wellington, you know, specifically where the, you know, where the best in this country congregate yeah. for the winter, and, and and it was just a matter of a decade ago that the horses were okay, but but I, I went to a show the other day and there were some very very nice yeah. horses and a lot of them. Yeah, yeah. There, there used to be a time you used to go to an international competition. There might be one or two you take home. And now you you'd like you you'd need a fleet of lorries, wouldn't you? You know, you could take any one of a number of them. Take a lot of that one, that one, that one, that one, and that one. <laughs> so, how do you take and make a good horse into a great horse? So you, you, there, there's always that level of, uh, of, of, of the trainers always wanting to to make these things better. Um, can, can you do it in, in, in terms of trimming or shoeing, or, or, or do you believe that, that what you're given is, is, is what you got, and, and your job is to is to keep them sound and, and keep them going? Or, 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 or are there things that you can do mechanically to to, to improve a horse? Um, the answer is yes in both cases. Um, 
first and foremost, you can only you can only deal with what you've got. So, so the ability obviously has got to be there. You cannot make a great horse from just horseshoeing, but you can influence performance and reduce the likelihood of pathology with careful um, application of shoes. Um, when we look at the marking system now, you know, of dressage as a classic example. Um, and, and how fine it is, how close it is between, you know, the top sort of six or seven. You know, a, a half a percent, it could be the difference in winning a medal and not winning a medal, or winning a gold and winning a, winning a silver. So that, and this is where we, this is where, where, where Farry becomes really challenging. Because we will look at the data, we will look at the videos, we will look at the data, we will we will research it and we will see whether there's any and cross-reference that with any pathology of a certain movement so if a horse is repeatedly moved marked down for one particular movement there has to be a reason for it and in a majority of cases we normally from a from a fairy point of view we normally pick it up quite early because what we will see is we will see lever arms i'll see lever arms doing different things and then i'll say well yeah that's okay but actually the minute you're going to try this movement you're going to have difficulty and 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 that has happened so often where where we've said to riders okay take the pirouette for for example the collection for the pirouette and they'll shorten the stride shorten the stride shorten the stride then all of a sudden you have you have a, a hind limb that has a fractional deviation laterally on one side more than the other which means that when that hind limb then picks up and then rotates it comes underneath the center of mass too far and the horse then from a from an aesthetic point of view falls off falls off pirouette to the left is quite stable pirouette to the right is slightly unstable pirouette to the left gets sevens eights pirouette to the right gets fives so we can look at that and we can know but we normally pick that up quite early and there are there are changes that you can make in the shoe in that does not have any um, impact on anything else that merely acts as a as a stabilizer so it's for when that movement comes in that the horse is the limb then is more upright it is then more supported but more importantly when it loads if you put a slight stabilizer or a slight lateral extension on there or whatever wherever it needs to be to be as long as it's in the right place that then acts as a stabilizer you then and you get these riders that say actually this is incredible i'm always struggling to the right this, this this just feels so much better so so we know from from practice that we can make a difference we know from doing it for a long period of time that we don't get any any adverse effect as a result of it because when i started to do this in the early days the veterinary industry or profession in particular were saying they were very critical of it by saying well yes but you don't know what else you're affecting you don't know what else you're affecting you say, well, actually, I'm not affecting anything because I'm, a, I'm the way I place it, where I place it, I'm allowing the deviation of the limb to occur because that is natural. I'm allowing the limb to actually go in the direction that it wants to. I'm not affecting that. What I am affecting is the first point of contact because what I want to do is I want to bring this limb out slightly rather than come underneath the center of mass. Um, that then means that it's more upright and there's a tranche of things that happen there's a trade-off as that you know the hock displacement that we see the lever arm displacement laterally reduces so you reduce the likelihood of pathology you know in the hock etc 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 so that's just one classic example but that that that's that's what we do to put everything under the microscope you know with those top horses can we get an extra half a percent year on half a percent there um, and 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 you're duty bound to 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 at least have a look at it. On, on the horse where you're going to put the lateral extension, I think you first should get out the fuller and, and just wide that branch. And, and if that that, that they deemed is not quite enough, then, then then you'll start adding something. Absolutely, and I think I think I think we've been doing it for such a long time. You 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 instinctively look at it and you know what you're going to do. You know where it is. You know um, what it is that you're going to do. But they you can you can have a situation where where forging forging the heel so again you know the difference between a a a, a, a concave shoe and a, and a flat shoe uh, a concave shoe you are very limited in what you can do with that material because there's very little material there if you've got a three quarter fullered shoe and you've got a nice nice solid heel you can forge it you can fuller it um, you can then put extensions on there if you want to you know if, if it's deemed appropriate um, 
but I, but I think an awful lot of these things you have to be careful that, that just every horse that you see might not need a lateral extension. Yes. It, it, it again we come back to the ticking boxes, you know. And again, you may need it just on, on the one foot and not, not the other. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, we we treat e treat each limb individually. Um, now, if you look at, at um, the other golden girl, if you if you if if you look at uh, Minstrel Horace uh, as an example, he has a lateral extension on the left hind um, to give him uh, a stabilizer, but he actually he has a medial and lateral extension on the right hind, purely because of the way that he is conformed and the way that that he set up. Um, that's we've shot him like that all the time I've been shooting him, I've always shot him like that. Um, because it's the only thing that, 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 you know, to create that platform for him individually, mm -hmm. that's what you have to do. So, you know, two completely different shoes. And, and going back to, to, to the point of mismatched feet, you know, why, why do we shoe mismatched feet with the same shoes? I've never worked that one out. Um, I tend not to shoe to radiographs. Um, I have an aversion to shoe into radiographs unless there is a pathology. Um, a radiograph is a static sound bite, a moment in time of a limb that is loaded statically. And um, some horses, for example, might have an A frame in front. So to have an A frame and stood like this, they're going to be lower medially than, than they are laterally. If you x ray them, they will, they will certainly, uh, the, they will certainly be lower, and, and P3 will appear to be leaning medially. Um, some of those horses, not all, but some of those horses, if you try and straighten them up by actually trimming, if you can trim the lateral aspect, or even, or even elevating the medial aspect, you, they won't like it. They won't like it at all. Um, I, I'm very much for dynamic shoeing, so I'll use a, an X-ray. Um, if we have pathology, or if I think that there's something, some a reason why this horse's gait has changed, but I tend to to look more uh, intrinsically at the gait, at the at the at the limb loading, not necessarily the footfall, but the limb loading. Um, I'm not a great f fan of shoeing to a static X-ray. So, so do you try to get? The, the dynamic so it's like, like, like with the flat footfall or, or, do, or do you make modifications to your shoes to to, to lessen the the impact of if a horse is, a, is is less than perfect conformation I think I think we as an industry we're too hung up on footfall I think we 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 are looking at trying to get horses to land level and sometimes you don't they don't want to land level uh, and there's not a reason why they should land level um I think it's the limb loading phase is the one that I look at. Um, and yes, I will make modifications to shoes. I will sometimes occasionally put a, a, a medial lift on or a lateral lift or a spiral shoe on the basis that what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to create a platform that allows the limb to, 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 to come down on and, to, and the fetlock to hyperextend so that it has even pressure and even stability through what you've created as a baseline. Um, but that horse might land unevenly. It's first point of contact, right. but it's how the limb loads um, is the key. It's the key to soundness, without a shadow of a doubt, because the other, the other one will, will, repeat, re, uh, we will get repetitive strain injury, injury very quickly. So often, or it used to be, that, that it was very easy to identify a farrier's work by, by, by the, how they were set up, that everybody had a particular style. What, what, what would you, you, you probably uh, describe your style as being, if, if there is one? Uh, well, there is one, yeah, there's definitely one. Um, there's definitely one. It's quite interesting that, that, that when some of these horses, and they don't necessarily know who they are, if they go off and, and they go to competitions, the, the amount of people that have come back and said, uh, and farriers, you know, the, 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 you know, the show farrier, I looked at something and said, "Well, can I have a look at this?" And then they picked up. They said, "Oh, you know, Hayden Price shot this," and uh, and I don't know whether that's a good thing or a bad thing. I don't. I don't. Yeah, I've I've always had a, a style. I've always always had a style, and um, and I'm quite pernickety because the young the youngest apprentice I've got at the moment still 
hasn't quite got the heel uh, to my, and I keep telling him it's a trademark. It, 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 it's, it, there is, he hasn't quite got it. Uh, when, when we're finishing off and grinding up shoes and linishing them up and everything. Both with the front and the high uh, shoes? Both of them, and he hasn't quite got it yet. And he keeps trying and he gets frustrated and I say, no, it's like this, and you just do it, I say. <laughs> That's how I want it. And, and, you know, who knows, perhaps it doesn't make any difference, but, but that's how I want it. That's, that's what I like. That, that's hard to teach. Sometimes. I like it. It is, actually. It is very hard to teach. And I can understand his frustration because he thinks he's doing it. Yeah. And I, and I, and I just keep saying, look, you know, we're not seeing the same thing, you know. Yeah. But, but one day it'll click. Yeah. Well, it'll it'll, day, it'll, it'll, it'll all click. All the, you know, we can talk on specifics there because... I mentioned that you know we had the, the the Olympics in London as you as you well know, and because of British dressage and the fact that they that they had escalated to this sort of number one slot, there was pressure on everybody. Um, and these horses, we all know these horses, like human athletes, are prone to injury on a regular basis. You know, the pressure that that's placed on you is quite immense. I, I, I've been doing this for 30 years and I'd never ever experienced pressure that I placed on myself. Nobody else placed it on I placed it on myself. Um, and it was only afterwards, it was only after the Olympics that I realized you know, just how much pressure there was. Um, because like all teams, we had issues. Uh, we had issues that had to be dealt with. Um, that um, means that, that there is a potential selection issue. That means that there is a potential medal winning issue. Um, and those decision, the decision making process for that runs very, very deep and very, very high. And I think as practitioners and, and as service providers, even at that level, it's up to us to execute that in the same way that the riders would. The only difference between a rider and a coach and an owner and, and a support person like myself is that, that a rider might have one chance in their lifetime of going to an Olympics. Might be that one horse that's come along at that one time that they get selected for. So they have their whole career riding on this horse going to that Olympics. Their whole career. I've done three Olympics and I'll be doing a fourth so I'll have another day and whilst I might I might not have um, or it might not have worked um, is this something that I haven't done that's created that so I think I think you tend what you tend to do and when the pressure's really on there's no harm in having a little bit of self-doubt um, because I think if you if you if you don't have self doubt and if you don't question what you're doing, um, absolutely to the nth degree, then you're in danger of being just a little bit blasé about it. Um, but it, but it took me. I'm not, I'm not ashamed to admit that that the Olympics took me to a place I'd never been to before. It, with pressure. And. Uh, I'm not so sure I'd want to visit it again for a while, to be honest with you. But I think the pressure's off now a, a, a little bit. I think, you know, when we look at, at Team GBR, and we, um, we, we are, we, we've still got the number one. Um, that's fine, we, 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 you know, we're still up there. But I think there's an air of acceptability. I think we have to prove something. We, we, we'd come from, from winning, you know, silver in here in Kentucky. Um, uh, which was surprised. We, we surprised the, the the global scene, really. Um, but then, then Carl and 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 so forth, and and Laura and Charlotte and everybody else that comes through worked on that, you know, and they built on it rather than sit back on their laurels. Um, it it can be a very lonely place. It can, it can be a very very lonely place, and, it, and people think that that um, it, it that you get remembered for you know the event that comes in with three shoes and is not going to get through the trot up and somehow you do something that's going to get it through the trot up and people will remember you for that. It's the work that goes on on a daily basis that, that hopefully you'll get, you'll get recognition for because that's the bit that keeps these horses sound. You know, an accident can happen anywhere. You know, a horse can lose a shoe, it can overreach, it can do all sorts of things. 
but I think you know for me it's about it's about continually and that was that was the the I said to somebody um, yesterday uh, and I'm totally open book on it it was only after the Olympics that I drove home from Greenwich and I, and I was physically exhausted I was mentally exhausted and I was happy and I was elated and all of those sort of mixed emotions and when I was driving home I can honestly say for the first time in my whole career I felt comfortable in my own skin I actually felt as though as though I didn't really have to question myself anymore because we'd looked I'd looked after the whole of the team not just for the competition but actually for years before so, so I, I really felt I really felt good I, but it wasn't necessarily for the gold medal it was I just felt well we must have done something right you know over a continued period of time <laughs>